turn in your Bibles to John chapter 21. We are going to finish this morning the study of the Gospel of John. And uh, I, I mentioned in Sunday school, we started actually the Gospel of John on January the 9th. 2011. So it's two years and about three months going verse by verse, passage by passage through a book. And just, it's incredible because the things that are there. We're seeing a book written, of course, by John the Apostle and used by God to tell us about Jesus Christ. And as we study this book, we've seen that, that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is the Savior, that He is sent by the Father to die on the cross to pay for sin and rise again. That John tells us, and ready for this, he tells us 98 times in this book that you are saved by faith alone in Christ. 98 times. We see the clear grace message of salvation through this book. Now what we're going to do this morning, we're bringing our study to a close. We want to focus really on two things. One, we're going to look at Jesus, uh, John's word about himself and about Jesus Christ. Where John ends it by saying, here's, here's about me and here's about Jesus. And then we'll just get a quick review of the book. We'll go back and see the key verses there of John 20, 30, and 31 because that's really the summary and the, and the purpose of the book of John. And we'll just think through the book as we go through it. We want to clearly proclaim and we think about it as a new church we have the greatest privilege of all as we go out in this community we've got a message and it is the message of Jesus Christ it is the message of the good news message that you're saved simply by faith alone in Christ alone that he is the the savior and the king that he is the son of God the Christ and we get to tell people that in our community so there's some great things there you know there there are a lot of books written concerning the life of Jesus Christ. If you think about it, there's just all kind of books out there. He's the most important person who ever lived. When you think about it, our whole dating system is based on Jesus Christ, that he is the God-man. He is God, has existed from all eternity, at a point in time in history, left the glories of heaven to become a human being, to become the God-man. He is the Savior. He is the one who, who died on the cross and paid for sin. We think about the Gospels. If you said, where would you go to get the most information you could about Christ? Well, you could go to the Gospels, the four books that were written, and a lot of people want to say, well, the Gospels are the life of Christ. They're actually selected events from the life of Christ to present Jesus in a particular way. The Gospel of Matthew presents Jesus as the King of the Jews, the King of the world, the King of Israel. The Gospel of Mark presents Jesus as the servant of Jehovah who has come to do the will of the Father. And that is in Mark 10:45 to give his life as a ransom. The Gospel of Luke presents Jesus as the perfect person, the one who is able to die and be the substitute, the one who does, does what God wants him to do, and he's the perfect man. And then the Gospel of John, which we have studied over two years, presents Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the one who is, who is the Savior of the world, that all who believe in him have eternal life. Now, there's a lot of, those probably would be the greatest resources. If somebody said, I want to study about Jesus, I'd say, well, then go through the Gospels, go through that. There are many other books that have been written that, in my, and in my opinion, probably the best book. If you said, I just want a book, not just the Bible, but I want a book about the life of Christ, Dwight Pentecost has written a book called The Words and Works of Jesus Christ. And uh, he was uh, Professor Emeritus at Dallas Seminary. He's now 96 years old. He has taught there over 60 years. And uh, he's put together basically a chronology of the life of Christ. And he divides the study into two big parts, which makes sense. It's the words and the works. And when you think about it, his words, what did Jesus say? His works, what did Jesus do? That's the bottom line. And when we think about the Gospel of John, it's very plain that as you look through the Gospel of John, that's what he tells us. He gives us the words and the works of Jesus Christ. Think about it. His words were the seven I am statements. So I used to, we have a little handout that we used to give out that on one side it had the seven I am statements of Christ. He'd say things like, I'm the light of the world, I'm the resurrection of life, I'm the bread of life, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Those were the, the I am statements. That's his words where he describes who he is. But then it was his works, which are seven signs that Jesus did in the, in that are recorded in the Gospel of John where Jesus healed the, 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 the blind man. He, he changed the water to wine. He walked on the, the water. He raised Lazarus from the dead. That's just a few of them. There are at least seven signs that John writes and says, this is what Jesus did. There are statements, seven I am statements that Jesus made that John says, this is Jesus telling us who he is. And so as we looked at the Gospel of John over all these weeks and, and months, we see some great things. 
that John tells us that he is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Son of God, and this is what he's done and, and who he is. As we bring to a close our study this morning, as I mentioned a while ago, two things. We're going to do, we're going to finish our verse-by-verse -verse study. We're going to look at John 21, verses 24 and 25. In verse 24, John talks about himself, and in verse 25, John talks about Jesus. So we'll see that. And then, just a brief overview of the book. We always do that. When we start a study, we want to get a big overview of what the, what the book is about, and then we get to the end, we always want to put it back together. Starting next week, in Sunday school, we're going to start, we just finished the life of David this morning, and in Sunday school, we're going to do a brief four to five to six week study on end time events, how the end time events fit together. It could be longer than five or six lessons, it's according to how many questions and input and things that we have. Beginning next week, since we finished the Gospel of John, we thought it would be good, since we're a brand new church, that we would study the book of Acts. And, of course, that, yeah, if your Bible is open to John 21, if you just look, it's the next book. So you shouldn't have any problem finding it next week. And, and we're going to go through the book of Acts because the book of Acts is the beginning of the church and the spread of the message of Jesus Christ. We're a, a brand new church, and our responsibility is to spread the message of Jesus Christ in our community. So it, I think it's going to be a, a great study. We see our Savior in the Gospel of John. The book is foundational. Because it shows Jesus Christ as a Savior. And, and, and a lot of times, let me just say this. If a person came to you and they said, you know, I'm, I'm not really a believer. I've never really gone to church or anything like that. But I'm, I'm willing to, to think about what you people believe. Just say, why don't you read the Gospel of John? The Gospel of John was written so that people would see who Jesus is and they would believe in him. Now, we have little books called living, The Living Water that we have on the tables. They are the Gospel of John. We, we've told you over and over, pick up as many as you want. We've got thousands of them. And we want you to, even after we're through with the Gospel of John, we're going to have these books so that you can every week pick up three, four, five Gospel of John's. And as you have opportunities, talk to people and say, listen, here, take this, read this. This is called the Gospel of John. It's about Jesus Christ. And as people read the living Word of God, they'll be affected as they see these truths. So when we talk about this book we've just finished or we're finishing this morning, it is, it is the best if you just said, I want a book to give to somebody so they can see who Jesus is, this is the book, and we're bringing it to a close. This morning, we're going to look at verses 24 and 25, John chapter 21, and we see that, he, that John talks about Jesus and, and talks about himself. And he starts, of course, with himself in verse 24, and then in verse 25, he talks about Jesus. Let's look at it. Look at verse 24. This is the very end, and this is John writing, basically writing about himself. He says, this is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. He says, I'm the one telling you about Jesus. I'm the one that's told you this whole story. I'm the one that started at the beginning and said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I mean, he says, I'm the one that wrote all of these things. Now, let's remember for just a second, who is John? Now, he was one of the twelve. If you remember, Jesus went along, and people began to follow him, and they got to be pretty good crowds. And one night, Jesus went up on top of a mountain, and he prayed, and then he came out the next morning, and he said... James, John, Peter, Andrew, and, it, and he began, and he called 12 men to himself. And he said, you've been my disciples, you're going to be apostles, which means one sent forth with authority. So John was one of the 12. Now there was a whole group that followed Jesus. Then there were these 12 that he picked out. Of the 12, there were three men of these 12 that were really close with Jesus. Sometimes people call them the inner circle. It was Peter, James, and John. And there were times that Jesus, when, when Jesus went on top of the Mount of Transfiguration to show them what he would be like in the kingdom, he only took Peter, James, and John. When he went to, to raise a, a little 12-year-old girl who had died, when he went to raise her from the dead, he only took Peter, James, and John. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before he's going to the cross, and he tells everybody to be praying, and he picks Peter, James, and John and says, come over here, be close to me while I pray. Out of those three... John called himself the disciple who Jesus loved, which gave the indication that out of all of those people, Jesus would look at John and go, come here, you're my man, you're my man. He, he was the youngest of all of them, the best that we can tell. He lived the longest. And, and sometimes people say, well, you're not supposed to have any favorites. Jesus had favorites. He picked 12, and then he had three, and then he had John. You remember on the cross, who did Jesus entrust his mother to? 
to John. So when we've gone through this book, we, we see here's this guy, and John says, this is a disciple who is testifying to these things. So he's writing and says, I've, I've told you everything about Jesus that, Jesus that the Holy Spirit, that God wanted me to tell you. Now, he's not giving us the life of Christ. Nobody gave us the life of Christ. In fact, John ends the book by saying, if everything about Jesus is written down, I don't think the whole world could contain it, right? So they didn't give us the life of Jesus Christ. They gave us selected events from the life of Christ. In fact, they say that if you took every event in all four Gospels, it would be about 50 days, 50 different days that Jesus did things. So we have information about what Jesus did. Now, when you look at John... Here's what he says about himself, and three things stand out. Let me read the verse again. He says, this is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know his testimony is true. Three things. First of all, he's a disciple. Now, the word disciple means one who follows. It's a Greek word, mathetes, which means a follower, which means one who learns from someone else. But it became a technical term in the New Testament to mean not only one who had believed in Jesus Christ as Savior, but one who was going to follow Jesus Christ. Now, we know this, that salvation cost us absolutely nothing. Salvation is a gift. For a person to say, I, I, I want to have eternal life, I want to go to heaven, I want to be with Jesus Christ, it doesn't cost you a thing. Jesus died on the cross, paid for sin. He said, if you believe in me, you have eternal life. So simply by faith, by grace through faith plus nothing, it's a gift, we have salvation. But discipleship, to be a disciple of Jesus is going to cost you. It's going to cost you your life. You say, I give up my life. I want to live for Jesus Christ. John says, this is the disciple. John was saying that he was a disciple. See, salvation is by faith. It's a gift. But discipleship costs us our lives. So he begins or ends this part by saying, uh, I'm, I'm the disciple. I'm the one that, that lives for Christ. Now, let me raise a couple of questions for you. Are you a believer? Now, I hope and pray. Every one of you in this room, that you have put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, and that you'd say, yes, I have eternal life. I'm a believer in Christ. I've trusted in Him as my Savior. That's what salvation is. It's not your works or goodness or righteousness or anything. It's simply believing in Jesus Christ for eternal life. So I hope and pray that every one of you are a believer. And right where you're sitting right now, you can say, Lord, I, I believe that Jesus is my Savior, and I'm trusting in him to give me life. And, and you're a believer. The second question, though, and this is a big one, is are you a disciple? All of us in this room who have trusted in Christ as Savior, have you decided that you're going to live for Jesus Christ? And it's a, big, it's a big decision. Romans chapter 12, where he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices. That's where you come to the point and you say, I have eternal life, and I know I'm saved, and I know I'm going to heaven, but I want my life to count for Christ. So as John says, this is the disciple who is testifying these things. I guess my question to all of us, do you know Christ your Savior? And second, if you do, are you living for Jesus Christ? That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to live for Jesus Christ. Our goal as believers is to be a disciple. And when we go into this world, it is to make disciples. Not just lead people to Christ, but lead them Christ, train them, equip them so they can live for Christ. The second thing that he says, notice he says, this is the disciple who testifies to these things. The second thing about him is he bears witness. He proclaims that Jesus Christ died and rose again. He bears witness who Jesus is. Basically all who believe in Jesus Christ have eternal life. He says, I'm the one that tells people about Jesus. He says, this is the testimony who testifies. This is the, the disciple who testifies of these things. He's the one that tells about it. Now, I, I think that if you, if you look at his life, and the best that we can tell, he was with Jesus about three to three and a half years. That was Jesus' ministry. The Gospel of Luke tells us that when Jesus was about 30 years old, he began his ministry. The best we can tell is most of these guys, uh, at the, pretty much at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he picked them, and he said, come follow me, come do this. And then he ended up picking 12 of them to be really close to him, to be his apostles. John was one of those. He says, this is a disciple who testifies of these things. He tells about Jesus. Now, let me just say this. We're to do the same thing. We're to testify about Jesus Christ. See, it, it's all about Christ. It's not about us. Now, we talk about our church, and we want people to come. And the, the, the way you grow as a church is you invite people to come. That's how you grow. You reach out and you say, would you like to come? We'll meet you there. We'll save you a place. We'll pick you up. And people come and then they, they like you 
and they maybe and they like you and then and then they begin to come and that's how churches grow in that way as you reach out to people and you lead them to Christ and you bring them and you all of those things but but it's really not about that it's about Christ and the goal is that as we go out these doors we tell people about Jesus Christ because salvation is in a person, is in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's, that's the plan. I read this the other day. I thought it was pretty neat. It says, witnessing is one beggar telling another beggar where to get the food. Well, the food is the bread of life, Jesus Christ. And so we're out there. We, we've got the message. We know that we have eternal life because of Jesus. So we want other people to know how they can have eternal life through Jesus Christ. There's a third thing that he says. He says, this is the disciple who testified to these things and he wrote these things and we know that his testimony is true. The third thing is that his message is true. He's got a true message. He's telling the truth. He was with Jesus Christ. He saw Jesus Christ. He saw Jesus die on the cross. He saw Jesus when he was raised from the dead. He saw the miracles. He saw Jesus do the seven signs written in his book. That's why he wrote them. He said, I wrote, these, I wrote this book. I wrote these signs so you could see it. He heard Jesus say, I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He, he heard Jesus say all that, and he saw Jesus do that. We we can believe the message. John 17, 17, thy word is truth. He tells about Jesus that he is the way, the way of salvation, the truth of salvation, and the life giver. Do you think about that? He's the way of salvation, he is the truth, and he's the way to have life. See, when you believe in Jesus Christ, he gives you eternal life life you're dead we're all dead in trespasses and sins we're spiritually dead when we believe in jesus he gives us life it's powerful we can go to the word of god we can trust it so when you when you think about uh john he says he says i'm a disciple who bears witness and i tell the truth we could say the same thing as disciples of christ we're to bear witness to tell the truth about jesus we're disciples bearing witness and telling the truth. Same as John. We get to do that. It's the greatest privilege of all. Some people say, oh, my life's not worth living. My life's not worth living. I don't even know why I'm here. I'll tell you why you're here. You're here to be a representative of Jesus Christ. You're here to tell people about Christ. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. We get to tell people the message. So think about that. Well, from there, he's been talking about himself. He's the disciple who tells these things, and he tells the truth. And then he closes it by telling about Jesus. And here's what he said. There are also many other things which Jesus did, which, if they were written in detail, I suppose, that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. He says, there's so many things Jesus did that I, he said, I didn't even try to write it down. I didn't even try to tell you about who he is and what he said and what he thought and what we know about him and all these kind of things. He said, gosh, if, if all that would try to be written down, I don't even think the whole world could hold the books. There's so much that when you study the Bible, you're only getting selected events of the life of Christ. There, when, you, when we study the book of Acts, the book of Acts only covers 30 years. People say the book of Acts is the story of the church. Yeah, for the first 30 years. And not a lot of details there. Emphasis on two main people, Peter and Paul. And we'll see it as we go through that. So there's so much there. He says, you know, if it were all written down, I, I suppose that the whole world itself could not contain the books. Why? Because we only have a partial knowledge of Jesus Christ. John 1, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word, what does it say? It's God. So Jesus is God. John 1, 14 says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So here is God at a point in time in history becoming a human being, the God-man, and he dwelt among us. It goes on to say, and we beheld his glory, his glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now listen, there's just so much you can know. See, he's an infinite God, and we're finite people. So when we say, I want to know a lot about God, well, there's a whole lot you're never going to know because you're not God. He's infinite, and we're finite. And when we start saying, I want to know a lot about Jesus, he said, listen, I've given you probably, uh, listen, let's say this. If we get this down, he might give us some more, okay? But um, we hadn't got this down after all this time. Think about it. We will never know all there is to know about our Savior. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. His plan is to die and rise again, and he did that, to pay for sin, to conquer death, and to give eternal life.
So as John closes the book, he says, I'm the disciple bearing witness about Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the one that gives eternal life to all who believe. So think about it. That's who he is. The thing that I love about the book is that if someone is is asking you about Christianity, about Jesus, about, about salvation, about eternal life, about all that, as you lead them to Christ. But you could say, listen, why don't you read this book? Because in this book, we see that Jesus is God, that he died and rose again, that he's coming again. And 98 places in this book, he says you're saved by faith. Now, there's some confusion. We know there's confusion in our world about what does a person have to do to have salvation. And you hear people say, do this and do this and do this and do this. John is very clear. Ninety-eight times he says, believe and you have life. Believe. In fact, I I challenged some of you and and just thought, why don't you read the Gospel of John? Just maybe read a chapter a day. And as you read that chapter... Every time you see the word believe, mark it down. Just say, okay, chapter 1, verse believe. Chapter 1, verse, John 1, 12. As many have received him, receive. What does receive mean? Even those who believe in his name. Okay, 1, 12 has one. You know, so you start going through the book. You'll find 98 places it says whoever believes. It's a powerful truth. As we bring this study to a close, I want you to think about something. Let's think about the book. The book is divided into three big sections. And we saw this at the very start. We saw it as we went through it. But chapters 1 through 12, the first 12 chapters of the Gospel of John deal with his public ministry, how Jesus was out among the people, how he did the different things. Chapters 13 through 17 is what we call his private ministry, where he was in the upper room with the men the night before he went to the cross. And then chapters 18 through 22, actually, excuse me, 21. It's not supposed to be 22. But... Uh, as he went to the cross, as he died, as he rose again, as he walked on the earth. So there's all of those kind of things there as well. And we'll see that. The key verse in the book is John. I don't think I have a uh, slide for this. But the key verse is John 20, verses 30 and 31. And we'll talk about it in just a second. Two big aspects of the way the book breaks up. If you could slide. There's a public ministry and a private ministry. And and, and we see in his public ministry, and let's just talk about it for just a second. In his public ministry, he did seven signs. In fact, in the first 12 chapters, he lists these seven signs. The very first one is famous. He changed the water to wine. He healed a man. He got a guy was born blind. He walked on the water. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He did all of these different things. There's seven of them found in the Gospel of John. It shows his works. Then we have his words. Now, some of those are found in the first 12 chapters. Some of them found a little bit later as well. But they're called the I am statements. And the reason that's so important is when we went through those statements, we realized that the title of God's name is I am. We went back to the time in which Moses saw the burning bush back in the Old Testament and he saw the burning bush and it was God who told Moses to go to Pharaoh and lead the people out and Moses said, who do I tell him sent me? And God said, tell him I am sent you. I am who I am. The title and the name of God is I am. Not I was and not I will be, but I am because he always exists. And when Jesus would say, I am the bread of life. He's claiming to be God. And so we saw that in these words of Jesus Christ. Now, the words and the works go together. Just, uh, I want you to see something. He did these signs. He did this, and, and, and the Old Testament, yeah, you can go to that one. The, the Messiah, when the Old Testament said when the Messiah would come, he would do two different things. He would do works, and he would do words. His works were these miracles. His words were the good news message. In Isaiah 62 and Isaiah 66, it says that when the Messiah comes, the lame would walk, the blind would see, the dead would be raised, and the good news would be preached. That's exactly what Jesus did. That's his words and his works. And that's why John gave us seven signs of his works and seven I am's of his words because all it was 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 showing that Jesus is the Savior. It's powerful truth. He is the one that the Old Testament said would come. Now, that's his public ministry. Now, let's talk about his private ministry for just a second. That was in the upper room. Now, if you go to 
to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called synoptic Gospels, which means they follow the same pattern. So if you read Matthew, and then you read Mark, and then you read Luke, you say, they're, they're a lot alike. When you read John, it's different. It has a different format. If you read the other three Gospels, and you see the last night, Jesus before the cross, you get hardly anything. One Gospel only has like eight verses about the upper room. One other Gospel has just a little bit, like a half a paragraph. The Gospel of John has five chapters on the upper room. And he gives us what Jesus said and did that last night. Now, I'm going to remind you of some things that he said. He gave them the greatest example. He got up. He took off his top. He got a towel. And he went around and he washed every one of their feet. And, of course, when he came to Peter, Peter said, you, you're not going to wash my feet. He said, yeah, I am. He said, no, you, you're not washing my feet because I, you're the greatest of all. That's what a servant does. We're all embarrassed because we should have already done that, and you're doing it, and I'm not going to let you wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you won't have anything to do with me, or I won't have anything to do with you. He went, okay, go ahead and wash my feet. Wash me all over. He said, no, no, just your feet. And he got up and said, I've shown you an example of servanthood. You want to be great? You be a servant. And he taught them that that night. And then he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If it wasn't that way, I'd have told you. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it wasn't that way, I would have told you. I'm going to come back and get you. And where I am, you will be. So he told them that. And then he said, you know what? I'm the vine and the branches. If you abide in me and I abide in you, you can produce much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. You've got to be close to me if you want to do things for me. And then he said, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's been with you, but he's going to live in you and he's going to be your power and he's going to reveal things to you and you're going to learn things from the Holy Spirit and he's gonna, basically he's going to give you new revelation, which is what we call the New Testament. And then he ended that whole thing with a prayer, John 17. And he prayed for them and he prayed for us. He prayed for those who will believe in the future. And that was us when he did this. That was the upper room. Powerful, powerful truths. And then the last part, the final ministry was his death and resurrection, paying for sins and conquering death. And it's so amazing. We saw his betrayal. We saw his arrest. We saw the six trials, three before the Romans, three before the Jews. Three before the Jews, he was found guilty. Three before the Romans, not guilty. They still put him to death. We saw him crucified. We saw him dying. We saw him paying for sin. We saw him buried. We saw him risen from the grave. Ten different times he appeared to those after his death and resurrection. Powerful truth. I want you to look at John 20. Look at verse 30. There are many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples. John says, there are other things Jesus did. I didn't write them down, which are not written in this book. I didn't write them all down. If you go through the Gospels, all the Gospels you find about 35 miracles. John only records seven of them. But these have been written. I wrote these signs so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's the purpose of the book. That people see who Jesus is and they believe in him for eternal life. I hope every one of you in this room have believed in Christ for eternal life. I hope that when we spread out into this community, we take the message of Jesus Christ. See, salvation is in a person. It is the person of Christ. The world thinks salvation is in what you do. I'm going to try to live a good life. I'm going to try to keep the Ten Commandments. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to try not to sin. I'm going to try to do right things. Salvation is not in you. It's in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the one who died on the cross and paid for sin. He is the one that became our substitute for us. By faith in Christ, we have eternal life. Salvation is God giving to us eternal life. It's not us giving something to God. There's confusion. People say, give your life to Jesus. You're not giving your life to Jesus to be saved. You're trusting in Christ as your Savior to be saved. You're not giving him anything. He doesn't need anything from you. He's the Savior, not you. He gives you eternal life. As we finish, let me give you some applications. 
The first one is this. Let's clearly proclaim the good news message. That's the story. The story of the Bible is how the perfect God brings sinful man back to himself using his son, Jesus Christ. That's the story of the Bible. Jesus is the son of God. He is the one who did the seven signs. He is the one who made the seven I am statements. He is the Savior. He is the one who died and rose again. Every person in this room needs a Savior. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. We're supposed to be separated from God. But Jesus took our place. He died for me and he died for you. And whoever believes in him has eternal life he offers that that's the offer the offer is not a good life the offer is not a rich life the offer is eternal life and by the way eternal life means exactly that it means life forever when you believe in jesus christ as your savior you have that exact moment eternal life and you are saved forever so let's be clear on the message we're to be channels of God's truth. We're to proclaim Jesus Christ as Savior. Second, be clear on the response. The response is to trust in Him as Savior, to believe in Him for eternal life. Don't confuse the message. Don't confuse the, what people need to do. Just take the Gospel of John. 98 times he says, believe, 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 believe believe there's over 160 places in the new testament that says believe 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 i read this the other day i mean i'm going to read it to you this is what the person wrote he says a friend of mine relayed to me an incident that i'm not able to forget a man confused about what he had to do to be saved went to his pastor he told the pastor, he says, Pastor, one person tells me I must invite Jesus into my heart. Another one tells me I must make him Lord. Another one tells me I must surrender my life to him. Another one tells me I must take up my cross and follow him. Leaning across the desk, he said, tell me, what do I have to do? More than once, we've seen this kind of confusion in people because they've gotten message after message after message. The scripture says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's that simple. Be clear on the response. Jesus died and rose again. Whoever believes in him has eternal life. The third thing, and that is let's fulfill our responsibility. And our responsibility is to make disciples. Our responsibility is to be witnesses of Christ. Our responsibility is the same as John who says, I'm a disciple of Christ, and my job is to tell the truth as I bear witness about Christ. We're to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Our responsibility is to tell the truth about Jesus Christ and tell people that he died and rose again and whoever believes in him has eternal life. It is our desire to leave a legacy, a legacy of people knowing the grace message of salvation, understanding that truth, leading other people to Christ, training them and equipping them to do the same thing. It's almost this way. We bring them in, lead them to Christ, bring them in, train them, and send them back out. That's what we want to be known as a church. If you come to membership training, we're going to talk about our purpose, our plan, and our process as a church. Our purpose is to make disciples, leading people to Christ, training them, and equipping them. That we fulfill our responsibility. We thank God for the gospel of John.